Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program. My name is Coogan Collins, and I'm the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and study along with us. Be sure to check out all of our lessons on YouTube. Now let's get to our lesson. The book of Romans is considered one of the greatest letters Paul wrote. Some have said that it contains the heartbeat of Christianity. Alexander Campbell said the message of Romans becomes a key to all of Paul's letters. A man by the name of John R. W. Stout describes Romans this way. The epistle to the Romans is the fullest and most coherent manifesto of the Christian gospel in the New Testament. In it, the Apostle Paul unfolds the whole counsel of God. There is a grandeur, a comprehensiveness, a logic about his exposition which has commanded the admiration and compelled the study of all succeeding generations. Many more quotes could be made that talk about how great this letter is. It's also the longest letter that Paul wrote. Though this was the sixth letter Paul wrote, you'll notice that you'll find it to be the first book listed right after the book of Acts in the New Testament. Some think maybe the reason it was put first was because it was the longest and because this letter is considered his masterpiece. Paul did not write the letter with his own hands but dictated it to Tertius who added his own greeting near the end of the letter. Romans 16 verse number 22. Of course if you want to get technical the Holy Spirit is the true author of Romans. It is implied that Phoebe was the one who delivered this letter to Rome, Romans 16, verse number 1. Most believe that Paul wrote this letter while he was at Corinth for three months on his third missionary journey around A.D. 57 to 58. Since Paul is the writer of this letter, I want to take a quick look at his life by looking at his timeline. 3 B.C. to A.D. 34, Paul was born an Israelite at Tarsus, around the same time as Jesus and John the Baptist were. Acts 22, verse 3, Philippians 3, verse number 5. He was a Roman citizen by birthright. Acts 22, verse 28. He started school at age 6 or 7, and the Old Testament would be the focus of his study. At age 13, he would go through Bar Mitzvah, which is assuming the full obligation of the law. In Jerusalem, Paul studies and trains under the famous teacher Gamaliel. Acts 22, verse number 3. A.D. 35 to A.D. 43, Paul watches and consents to Stephen's death. Acts 7, verse 58, and eight, chapters 8, verse number 1. He inflicts great persecution on Christians. Acts 8, verses 1 through 3, chapters 26, verses 10 through 11, and Philippians 3, verse number 6. On the road to Damascus, Paul meets Jesus and is converted and baptized. Acts chapter 9. At some point over the next three years, Paul goes to Arabia and then returns to Damascus, Galatians 1, verse 17. Paul's life is in danger and he escapes Damascus by being lowered down the outside wall through a window in a big basket, Acts 9, verse 24, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 32 through 33. Paul makes his way to Jerusalem and Barnabas brings him to the apostles, Acts 9, verses 26 through 29, Galatians 1 and verse 18. Once again, Paul's life is in danger and he travels to Tarsus, Acts 9 verse 30. Later, Barnabas goes to Tarsus and finds Paul and they go to Antioch and teach a great number of people over the next year, Acts 11 verses 25 through 26. Paul and Barnabas deliver aid to the brethren in Jerusalem, Acts 11 verses 29 through 30. When they complete their mission, they return to Antioch with Mark. Acts 12, verse 25. Now we have our first missionary journey, A.D. 44, 
through A.D. 49. The Holy Spirit separates Paul and Barnabas out for this journey, Acts 13, verses 2 through 3. They travel to Seleucia and set sail to the island of Cyprus, Acts 13, verse 4. They preach in the synagogues at Salamis and Mark assist them, Acts 13, verse number 5. At Paphos, they encounter a false prophet named Bar-Jesus who tries to keep the proconsul Sergius Paulus from hearing the word of God. Paul strikes Bar-Jesus blind by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the proconsul believes, Acts 13, verses 6 through 12. When they arrive at Perga, Mark departs and returns to Jerusalem, Acts 13, verse 13. Paul and Barnabas continue on to Antioch and Pisidia. Paul preaches his first and longest recorded sermon in the synagogue, Acts 13, verses 14 through 49. They are driven out of Antioch and they go to Iconium where they stay for a long time, boldly speaking the word of God, Acts 13, verses 50 through chapters 14 and verse number 3. Their lives are threatened, so they flee toward Lystra and Derbe, Acts 14, verses 4 through 7. In Lystra, Paul heals a crippled man, and the crowds try to worship them, Acts 14, verses 8 through 18. Paul is stoned and drug outside the city, presumed dead, but he gets up and goes back into the city, and the next day, Paul and Barnabas go to Derbe, Acts 14, verses 19 through 20. At Derby, they make many disciples. They return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch to strengthen the churches and to appoint elders. Acts 14, verses 21 through 23. They preach at Perga and return to Antioch in Syria, where they report to the church everything that happened on their journey. Acts 14, verses 24 through 28. Paul and Barnabas are sent to Jerusalem to ask the apostles and the elders if Gentiles must be circumcised. They decide that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, and they send Paul and Barnabas and other men back to Antioch with a letter explaining this, Acts 15, verses 1 through 34, and Galatians 2, and verse number 1. They preach and teach at Antioch, Acts 15, verses 35. Paul possibly writes Galatians from Antioch. Now we get to the second missionary journey, A.D. 50 to A.D. 54. Paul and Barnabas separate from one another over Mark, Acts 15, verses 36 through 39. Paul and Silas join forces and go through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches, Acts 15, verses 40 through 41. They go to Derby and Lystra, and Timothy joins the journey, Acts 16, verses 1 through 5. They go to Troas, and Paul has a vision of a Macedonian man asking for help, Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. They sail to Neapolis and travel to Philippi, where they meet Lydia and convert her and her household, Acts 16, verses 11 through 15. Paul and Silas are thrown into jail after Paul cast a demon out of a slave girl, Acts 16, verses 16 through 25. A great earthquake opens the jail doors and the chains holding the prisoners. Paul and Silas convert the Philippian jailer and his household, Acts 16, verses 25 through 34. They preach the word of God in the synagogue at Thessalonica and convert men and women, Acts 17, verses 1 through 10. They flee to Berea and convert more people. Paul goes to Athens while Timothy and Silas stay behind. Paul sends word for them to join him, Acts 17, verses 10 through 15. Paul preaches to the people at Athens, converting men and women, Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. Paul goes to Corinth, and Timothy and Silas join him there. They teach the word of God for a year and six months there, Acts 18, verses 1 through 17. Paul writes 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Paul returns to Antioch of Syria after stopping at Ephesus, Caesarea, and Jerusalem, Acts 18, verses 18 through 22. Now we come to the third missionary journey, A.D. 54 through A.D. 58. Paul travels through Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening the disciples, Acts 18, verses 23. At Ephesus, Paul baptizes some disciples in the name of Jesus who had only had John's baptism, Acts 19, verses 1 through 7. Timothy is sent to Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17. He returns to Ephesus later, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 10 through 11. Paul writes 1 Corinthians. Paul preaches in the synagogue for three months and then at the school of Tyrannus for two years, Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. He sends Timothy and Erastus into Macedonia, 
Acts 19, verse 21. On his way to Macedonia, Paul stops at Troas to meet up with Titus, but he never shows up. Acts 20, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 13. Paul meets up with Titus, possibly in Philippi, and writes 2 Corinthians, sending Titus with the letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 6, chapters 8, verse 6, Acts 20, verse 2. He goes to Greece for three months and writes the book of Romans, Acts 20, verses 2 through 3. From Greece, Timothy and other brethren go ahead of Paul to meet him later at Troas, Acts 20, verse 4 through 6. Paul stays seven days at Troas and partakes of the Lord's Supper, Acts 20, verse 7 through 12. He travels to Asos by foot and sails to Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Trogolum, and stops at Miletus, Acts 20, verse 13 through 16. Paul sends for the Ephesian elders and he exhorts them, Acts 20, verses 17 through 38. From there he sails to Kos, Rhodes, and Patara, and they stop at Tyre for seven days, Acts 21, verses 3 through 6. Next, he stays at Ptolemus for one day, Acts 21, verse 7. At Caesarea, Paul stays with Philip the Evangelist, Acts 21, verses 8 through 14. And next, we have the account of him being in Jerusalem and the journey to Rome, A.D. 58 through A.D. 62. Paul goes to Jerusalem and is arrested in the temple, causing a mob, Acts 21, verses 15 through 36. Paul speaks to the mob, Acts 21, verses 37 through chapters 22 and verse 21. He speaks to the Sanhedrin Council, Acts 22, verse 30, through chapters 23 and verse 10. Some Jews plot against Paul and take an oath not to eat or drink until they kill him, Acts 23, verses 12 through 23. Paul is sent safely to the governor Felix in Caesarea, Acts 23, verses 23 through 25. Paul gives his defense to Felix, but he leaves him bound for two years, Acts 24, verses 10 through 27. Paul speaks before Festus and appeals to Caesar, Acts 25, verses 1 through 12. He speaks before King Agrippa and almost persuades him to be a Christian, Acts 25, verses 13 through 26 through 32. Paul and other prisoners began their journey to Rome, Acts 27, verses 1 through 2. At Sidon, Paul gets to visit with his friends and continues on to Myra, Acts 27, verses 3 through 5. They change boats and sail to Fair Havens, Acts 27, verses 6 through 8. Against Paul's warning, they set sail from, for Phoenix. A strong wind comes through and forces them by Kalana and then out to the sea until they shipwreck at Malta, Acts 27, 9 through chapters 28, verse 1. At Malta, Paul survives a viper bite and heals many of the natives over the next three months, Acts 28, verses 2 through 10. From there, they sail to Syracuse and stay for three days, Acts 28, verses 11 through 12. They sailed to Regium and then to Potili, where he was allowed to stay seven days with his brethren, Acts 28, verse 13. In Rome, Paul stayed for two years under house arrest in his own red house, where he could receive visitors and preach the word, Acts 28, verses 17 through 31. Paul writes Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. Timothy is in Rome with Paul part of the time. Philippians 1, 1, Colossians 1, 1, Philemon 1, 1. Timothy was in prison at some point during this time, Hebrews 13, verse 23. Now let's look at the time period of A.D. 63 to A.D. 67. Paul is released from his first Roman imprisonment as he anticipated, Philemon 1, verse 22, Philippians 2, verses 19 through 24. He possibly goes to Spain, Romans 15, verse 28. Paul goes to Crete, where he leaves Titus to work with the church, Titus 1, verse 5. He travels to Miletus, 2 Timothy 4, verse 20, and possibly goes to Colossae, Philemon 1, verse number 22. Paul meets up with Timothy in Ephesus and leaves him there to work with the church as he travels to Macedonia, 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. He was at Troas, where he left his books and cloak, 2 Timothy 4, verse 13. Paul goes to Philippi and possibly writes 1 Timothy, Philippians 2, verses 19 through 24. He possibly writes Titus on his way to Nicopolis, where he planned to spend the winter, Titus 3, verse number 12. 
After two years or more of being free, Paul is arrested again. Paul writes his last letter, 2 Timothy, where he sends for Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verses 9 through 12. Paul's life comes to an end. Tradition says that he was beheaded under the order of Nero. Now that we've taken a glimpse into the life of Paul, let's get back to the book at hand. In this book, Paul deals with such things as the necessity to be saved by having an obedient faith and how sin will separate us from God. He goes to great lengths to explain that we are not justified by the law of Moses, but by the law of Christ through faith. He also explains in detail what the grace of God is all about and what happens to us when we are baptized into Christ in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 12 gives some great advice on how to live the Christian life, and Romans chapter 8 ensures us that nothing will separate us from the love of God. This letter was written to the Roman Christians, which would have been a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Rome was the capital and largest city of the Roman Empire. Rome may have had as many as one million inhabitants during imperial times. Rome was likely named after the Etruscan family Rumlin. Legend holds that the city was founded on or about 753 BC, though some have suggested the site was first occupied as early as 2000 BC. Rome plays a significant role in the New Testament. Aquila and Priscilla were banished from Rome by Claudius, Acts 18, verse 2. Paul was kept under house arrest in Rome, Acts 28, verses 16, 17, 30, and 31. Paul addressed the epistle of Romans to Christians living in the city. According to secular history, Paul and Peter lost their lives in Rome. Rome was located about 15 miles from the sea, but because the Tiber River was navigable, Rome became a major seaport city. Rome was the center of an extensive road system which helped create the notion that all roads lead to Rome. The Catholic Church claims that Peter was the one who established the church in Rome and that Peter served as a bishop there for 25 years until his death. However, there is no evidence to back this claim up, but there is evidence that contradicts their claims. For example, at the end of Romans, where Paul mentions those he knew from Rome, he never mentions Peter. Paul never mentions Peter in the letters that he wrote from Rome either. Now, we don't know for sure who started the church in Rome, but we do know from history that Jesus was known in Rome around AD 49. While we don't know who started the church in Rome, it's possible that some of the Jews that lived there that went to Jerusalem for the Passover and learned about Jesus that they then went back and they taught their people about Christianity and they were carrying out the Great Commission. The purpose of this letter is, first of all, it was to let them know that he wants to come to them and preach. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 15. Number two, he wants them to understand that the gospel of Christ is God's saving power for all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. Number three, he reviews and reminds them of several things regarding the gospel. Chapters 15, verse 15. Number four, he tells them of his plans of going to Spain and hopes they will offer him some financial support. Chapters 15, verses 22 through 24, and verse number 28. Now let's take a look at the key words of Romans. Righteousness and its related words are found 66 times. Law is found 75 times. Faith, belief, and believe are found 61 times. Sin, sinner, and sinful is found 58 times. Death, die, and kill is found 48 times. Flesh, fleshly, and carnal are found 30 times. Grace is found 25 times. Holy and related words are found 24 times. The theme of this letter can be seen in Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Some of the great doctrines taught in the book of Romans are as follows. Stresses the need for us to be righteous before God in our hearts and lives. Stresses justification through an obedient faith and the forgiveness of sins. Gives a clear picture of what happens when we are baptized into Christ. Teaches how we are no longer under the law of Moses. Teaches how God is involved in our lives and how no one can separate us from Him. The book of Romans is designed for those who 
hunger to know more than just the basics. While Romans covers some of the basics, it's a more complicated letter that is often misunderstood and misinterpreted by those wanting to push their various doctrines. As students of the Bible, we need to be able to answer those who use Romans 1 through 4 to teach that we are saved by faith only, and use Romans chapter 5 to teach original sin, and use Romans 9 through 11 to support dispensational doctrines. By the time I am through with the book of Romans, you should be able to deal with all of these false doctrines I mentioned and many more. I want to be clear, Romans can be challenging at times and there may be some things that we don't agree on completely. Mr. Haley suggests two reasons Roman is difficult to understand. One is Paul's literary style. He had a habit of starting a sentence and then digressing and digressing and digressing so that in some cases, phrases, instead of modifying that which immediately proceeds, modify something way back, making it hard to see the connection. The other reason is that the epistle is about a problem that to us is no problem at all, but was then a live, burning problem, whether a Gentile could be a Christian without becoming a Jewish proselyte. Even though parts of Romans can be challenging to understand, I believe it can be understood and should be understood. Here is a quick outline of Romans. Romans chapter 1, greeting, God's judgment on the unrighteous Gentiles. Romans chapter 2, God's judgment on the unrighteous Jews. Circumcision is of no value in the Christian age. Romans chapter 3, all people are sinners. God's righteousness in everything. Righteousness obtained through faith. Romans chapter 4, Abraham's justification through faith, God's promises realized through faith. Romans chapter 5, peace with God is possible through Jesus, repairing the tragedy of sin as introduced by Adam and continued by all people. Romans chapter 6, dying to sin and living to God, slavery to righteousness rather than to sin. Romans chapter 7, Christians are released from the law of Moses, Humanity's inability to keep the law. Romans chapter 8, life in the Spirit, future glory through the love of Christ. Romans chapter 9, God is not unjust in His inclusion of Gentiles. Romans 10, the necessity of preaching the gospel so that all may hear and be saved. Romans chapter 11, the possibility of salvation for Israel even while God grafts in Gentiles. Romans 12, living life as a sacrifice in response to God sacrifice of grace, life in the body of Christ. Romans chapter 13, submission to governmental authorities, love and moral purity. Romans chapter 14, do not pass judgment or be a stumbling block in matters of judgment. Romans chapter 15, learning from the Old Testament, the example of Christ, Paul's plans. Romans 16, personal greeting, final instructions. A simpler way to outline Romans is to divide it into two equal parts. In chapters 1 through 8, Paul establishes his premise, and in chapters 9 through 16, he applies his premise. There is much for you and I to learn from this great epistle from Paul. I hope you'll be able to be here for all the lessons, and I hope you'll be able to read the book of Romans through many times over uh, with, within the upcoming weeks. While sometimes Romans will make our brains hurt and make us scratch our heads. Once we begin to see the connections and have a better understanding of Paul's letter, then we'll be uplifted and encouraged to dig deeper into Romans and all that it offers us. Hope you found this lesson helpful. No matter what lesson I preach, I want you to test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to the Bible. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it is too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we're capable of being wrong. One thing we know for sure is that God's word will not lead us astray. So we can always trust in it. As Psalm 146.3 says, Do not put your trust in princes nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Psalm 18 verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter.
If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course that you can take that will walk you through the basics. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I've preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials that you are free to study and use. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you'll find our new video lessons like the one that you're watching now. I know we live in a fast-paced world where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything. But I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy, but we must be careful that we don't get to the point where we get so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority. If you find my lessons to be helpful, be sure and tell people about our program so that others can hear sound lessons from the Bible. I hope you have a blessed day. Well.